Thanks everyone for coming. We have uh, Ron Rothblum here again from the Technion to uh, tell us additional details about proving as fast as computing. So part two, take it away. Awesome, thanks Justin. Uh, okay, hi, good morning everyone. So as far as I can tell, everyone that's here was also in my previous talk. Um, I will do, try to do like a really brief reminder of what was going on last time and what I plan to cover uh, this time. Okay, so, so the setup, uh, which I guess we all know by now, we're trying to construct succinct arguments, um, basic notions of completeness and soundness, so correct statements should be, you should be able to prove, false statements you should not be able to prove, other than with some small probability, and we're looking, we're doing this for empty statements and we want short communication. Uh, zero knowledge is sort of uh, uh, optional, and we're focusing throughout this talk uh, on circuits, mainly on, on Boolean circuits, okay? Um, as was said uh, last time, I view, I'm going to present protocols that are interactive. They are public coins, so you can reduce the interaction using Fiat Shamir, at least heuristically. Okay, uh, one thing that's gonna pop up a lot uh, in the talk today is epsilon, which is the soundness error, okay? Which we would like to be as small as possible. Okay, so what we covered last time, uh, we're going to go into a little bit of uh, reminders of some, some of the technical stuff, but the main technique that we uh, discussed is this technique uh, that we call code switching, which morally, the way I think of it, is a way to design IOPs so that you can encode whatever you care about using uh, some code that has nice properties. It does need to be a, a tensor code for what we showed. But then pretend that the actual, that the encoding that you sent was actually encoded under some other different tensor code that may have other useful properties. And, you know, execute the protocol as, as though that were uh, the code that had actually been sent. But then at the end, switch, meaning, you know, verify, uh, you know, emulate access to the, the sort of pretend virtual code using the actual code that was sent. So that was the idea behind code switching, which we saw. And using this, we were able to derive uh, linear size provers for arithmetic circuits um, and high rate IOPs. So just th something that I think I wasn't maybe clear enough about last time, clarification in terms of sort of credits. So this idea of code switching was in my work with, with Noga from 2020, uh, but we were sort of, uh, our mindset was de deriving high rate IOPs, IOPs that are very short, and sort of follow-up works uh, sort of use the fact that you can use the same technique, uh, give or take, to construct these linear size provers for arithmetic circuits. Essentially, one way to do it is to take our approach and replace the high rate codes with a linear time encodable code, and that would be good enough. So going back to the main, so, so far, what we, saw, what we saw last time in terms of like actual proofs were how to construct uh, argument systems for arithmetic circuits. But the main theorem that I stated and did not prove was for Boolean circuits. Right? So the main theorem said that for Boolean circuits, which in a sense are the most challenging uh, case, we want a strictly linear size prover expressed as a Boolean circuit. Um, and in terms of ver verification, we have uh, O of uh, circuit size preprocessing. As was pointed out, this preprocessing is non-reusable, so if you don't like it, we will need to have a linear size verifier. Um, and yeah, and the, the communication is polylogarithmic, the number of rounds is log, can easily be, be made log-log, and the soundness error is an arbitrarily small constant. Right, so uh, we'll try to sort of see more or less the proof of, of that today. Then we had the second result, with, a result with Justin, which sort of under the same assumption, uh, linear time computable or linear size collision resistant hashing, same assumption as before. Here, what the big benefit is that we get two to the minus lambda soundness error rather than a constant. And the overhead that we pay is sort of, you know, exponentially better than the naive thing of just doing things in parallel. So it's only polylogarithmic in, in this lambda. This, so that's the green parts. The red parts is that we only know how to do this for certain types of Boolean circuits, so ones that have a lot of repeated substructure. We'll see this today. Um, but, but here the verifier can really be sort of, as long as this repeated sub, the, the, the substructure that's being repeated is small enough, the verifier is going to be really fast. Any questions? So far it's stuff uh, that we've seen, and I will uh, hopefully not bore you too much with a little bit of more reminders about uh, underlying techniques because we're going to use them uh, extensively today. We sort of saw that the main technical tool that gives rise to all of this stuff is this notion of IOPs or interactive oracle proofs. Um, we saw this before, it's kind of, for, them, for those coming from theory, it's an, an, a multi-round version of PCPs 
for those that are not, you just send over long messages, but at the end of the day, the verifier only reads a few bits. And you know, we saw that using vector commitments or Merkle trees, you can move from IOPs into succinct arguments. Right, so the, the easy part is, uh, you know, using the right assumptions, the easy part is getting good vector commitments, the hard part is designing good IOPs, so that's what we need to focus on. And we'll get to the side challenge later in the talk. So far, so good? Okay, in terms of tools, we have error correcting codes, um, you know, these mappings, taking messages into code words. We will care very much today about these two parameters, the rate, the amount of overhead of the code, and the distance of the code how good of an error correcting code it is, how much do code words avoid each other. And we had this uh, theorem saying you can't have your rate and eat it too. Um, so singleton bound saying that overall the sum of the rate and the distance can be at most one. So we'll come up. And codes are linear and systematic, we, we covered all of that. Multiplication codes, codes that have this property that if you multiply pointwise two code words, the resulting vector belongs to some related code, like we see with Reed, Reed Solomon. And tensor codes, which uh, we're going to use, uh, again, extensively today, have this property you encode rows, encode columns, or vice versa. We see that the effect of tensoring two codes is sort of doubling the rate, of the two rates of the codes. The effect of the distance is doubling the distances. Please stop me if you have any questions. This is just covering stuff from last time. Very soon, we will stop covering stuff from last time. This is the last uh, sort of reminder slide. Sum check, um, typically viewed as a protocol for checking that the sum of a low degree polynomial is equal to, uh, to zero, to some, val some predetermined value, um, using an interactive proof with very small communication. Here I'm abstracting it, I'm thinking of it as a sort of general protocol that you can uh, hope to have for any code. So given, uh, so we were looking at a code word a W belonging to a code E, I think of a very long code words. And we're interested in computing the sum of the message bits or message symbols uh, or elements of this code. So you can do this for low degree polynomials, for tensors more generally, uh, for Reed Solomon using Nick's work um, with IOPs. Yeah, so all this we saw. Good. So at this point, I want to introduce sort of a new abstraction, which will turn out to be very useful, which is, so you can think of it as a generalization of sum check. We call this an inner product check. So it looks very similar, but now instead of having, uh, so the notation switched a bit, but it will be okay. Uh, instead of having access to a single code word, I'm giving you Oracle access to two code words, C and C prime. And the goal is to compute the inner product between the two message parts. Okay? So in some check we had one code where we were looking at a sum. Now we have two code words and we're looking at the inner product. So this, this, this abstraction, on one hand, it's actually, uh, if you think of it, it's really used throughout everything, but it has never materialized as an abstraction. And I think the reason for that is that it's sort of typically trivial to get. Why? Because if your code C is a multiplication code, what you can do is take the pointwise product of C and C prime, and now do some check on that. Right, so you've, you've done this multiplication, and then sum, overall you have an inner product. So that is what is happening sort of everywhere. And usually there's no need to point it out because you just do the multiplication and you're done. In this work, it's going to be actually crucial to distill this notion. And the reason that is that we don't have any linear time encodable multiplication codes. So if we want to do something sort of like, the, like this picture, um, we cannot just follow this idea, multiply the code words and run some check, because we don't have fast enough multiplication codes. So at the heart of uh, our, our, this theorem that I'm, I'm going to prove to you is going to be a construction of some code C that is linear time encodable, it is not going to be a multiplication code, but nevertheless, it supports this operation. Right? So you can do this inner product check using uh, a linear size prover. So there's an IOP for proving sort of this inner product check, this extension of some check, with a strictly linear size prover, and also the encoding of the code is linear size. Okay, so that's going to be sort of the heart of the, uh, of the technical result. Okay, so really we're gonna have two steps. The major one is the first one. This is, uh, yeah, this is all uh, about getting the result with a constant soundness error. So the first step is constructing a protocol uh, code and a corresponding inner product check of linear size. 
Uh, once we have that, then getting, going from that to IOPs for general circuits will be pretty straightforward. Okay, so the focus is on, on constructing this thing. Uh, so let's give it a shot, right? So our goal now, again, is to design a code that is linear time encodable, but for which given two code words, you can, using an IOP, you can compute their, the inner product of the messages. So you know, let's design a code, and given all of these uh, you know, different types of codes that I've uh, told you about, here it may be a natural suggestion. So let's take, so I'm going to take my code C to be a tensor of two codes. It's a very highly skewed tensor. So in one direction, we're gonna have like a very small code, and in one direction, a very large code. So it's a tensor of D and E. D is sort of the large code. So I'm gonna fix a parameter A, think of it as a constant, 10. Okay, so A is equal to 10. So code number one takes pretty long messages of length n over 10, think of n as being very large, and I want it to be a linear time encodable code. We have such codes, and I don't need much beyond that. Okay, so D is a linear time encodable code, or maybe a tensor thereof, but, but let's ignore that. So uh, D is sort of fastest code that you have lying around. The other code that I will need is a code E, which is a tiny code, right? It's encoding just like 10-bit messages. And there, I do need for E to be a multiplication code, okay? So if I could have, uh, I think Tim asked about this last time, if I had a linear time and global multiplication codes, I wouldn't need all this nonsense, uh, but I don't. So I encourage students to think about follow it. Follow up on that question, is there any hope in kind of saying linear time and codability plus multiplicative code lets you do fast Fourier transforms or something like this? Um, potentially, I, I do think that the multiplication property underlies um, FFTs. So it'd be great if you could say like the barrier actually is faster FFTs. That would be pretty convincing. So otherwise, the worry is that like there's a lot of work to kind of you know get around this log factor that would be more directly sort of gotten rid of through other means. I, right? I think it would be so. Regardless, it would be from my understanding from from sort of coding theorists, it would be major progress, really major progress to design linear time encodable multiplication codes. Um, and you're asking, like, no, so, so I, I'm doubtful that if you had that, then you would have a speed up for FFT. Okay. But I think such a code would be a good replacement in a lot of places where you use FFT, and you would have the, the faster uh, evaluation. Like in TCS applications or actually for signal processing? I, mean, um, I don't know enough about signal processing to be confident about it, but it underlies sort of a lot of nice properties of, of Reed Solomon as a code follow from it being a multiplication code. So the Berlecamp Welsh decoding algorithm, stuff like that, the underlying thing that you have, or, or the use of Reed Solomon also in, in MPC, um, so, so that is a TCS or CS application, um, comes from the multiplicative property. So I think it would be very exciting to develop such a thing. Um, not exclusively only for IOPs, but more generally. But since we don't have uh, such a thing, we'll resort to sort of um, more elaborate techniques. Um, so again, we have our big code D, which is very fast. We have our code E, which is, it's a small code. We don't care so much about its encoding time because it's working on a constant size object. Um, right, so D is linear time uh, encodable, E is a multiplication code. And just, you know, as a sanity check, let's see what is the overall encoding time when we tensor these guys. So if I want to encode, so the blue part is the message, and I want to generate all of the orange stuff, the encoding. What do I do? Well, as we said, uh, for tensors, say I encode each one of the rows, right? That will take me n over a times some function of a, which I don't care about so much. Overall, that will be linear in n. I think of a as a constant. And then encoding all of the rows, I have uh, some function of a number of rows. For each one, the encoding is linear in n. Overall, I will have linear in n. Okay, I mean, there's no, re no real reason why not to use a relatively efficient multiplication code like Reed Solomon here, but I don't really care so far. Questions? So just in terms of the overall encoding time of this new code, it is linear. Okay, so I've shown you a linear time encodable code, but the, the heart of the matter is showing you this procedure for computing inner products, right? So let's try to do that. So here's the picture we have in mind. We have two code words from this newly designed code and we're trying to compute the inner product of the blue parts, right? So notation-wise, we're trying to compute sort of this thing, sum of uh, over ij, 
Cij times C prime Ij. Okay, so let's try to do this, and uh, here's the first attempt. So we know that all of the rows belong to our multiplication code, right? So if you take the first two uh, rows, you multiply them, the result should lie in sort of in the product code. If that makes sense, okay? You multiply the second two rows, it also lies in the product code. We go along and we do all of these. By the way, this can all just be done in the prover's head. So far, nothing has been sent. So I'm doing all of this, and now I want to add up all of the green rows. And now I want to claim a couple of things about the resulting sum. First thing I want to claim is that this resulting sum belongs to the product code of E. You see the why, why this is true? So re recall that each one of the green rows belongs to the product code because we just did multiplication, and this product code is linear. So when you add stuff up, the resulting thing also belongs to the product code. Okay, so that's one observation. The second thing is that I want to say that if I look at the first, oh, this, uh, the laser doesn't work. If I look at the first three entries of W and sum them up, I claim that I'm supposed to see something of interest there. Okay, what is it? Well, it's exactly the result that I'm looking for. If you look at the inner product between the blue parts of C and C prime versus the three first entries of W, each entry of W was computed essentially as an inner product of the corresponding columns. Now you add them up, overall you get the inner product. Okay, great, so I have the prover compute all of this stuff, just send W to me, it's a short message. Um, I check that the sum of the first three, three bits is the original claim that I have about the inner product, and the W is a code word. And now I seem to be in a really great, in really great shape, because um, if the prover sends the correct W as defined here, then I'll just see the sum there and I'm done. So if a prover is trying to fool me, uh, she has to send some other alternate W tilde, which disagrees with W. So we know that W is a code word of E star. We know that W tilde is a code word of E star because we explicitly check that. So if we have two distinct code words, they have to disagree on a lot of locations. That is what the distance guarantees, right? So now a very natural idea would be for the verifier to choose a column at random, and then sort of, you just need to check that, that the value in that column was computed correctly, so run another linear product, uh, another inner product check on this column, okay? So here's the, the, the picture, right? So we're saying that if the prover is trying to cheat, she will send a different W tilde. The red boxes are marking sort of places in which W tilde differs from W, should be a large fraction. Now our verifier, so the verifier doesn't see which ones are red or blue, she, uh, she just chooses at random. If we are lucky, she hits one of the red, the red boxes, in which case, if we just run uh, an inner product check that, that, that this value over here was computed correctly, meaning uh, you know, that the, the value there is basically the inner product of the two corresponding rth columns of C and C prime, then we're done. It seems, uh, seems very natural, seems very reminiscent of some check and stuff that I showed you. It, it is, actually. It also doesn't work. Um, and the reason is the following. So, so the problem is basically we want, we want to recurse. Um, right, right, we've shrunk the problem by a constant factor, by an A factor. We're pretty happy. And it seems very you know, natural to recurse. But the problem is that the column code is not from the code that I designed. It's from this linear time encodable code which I don't have much control over. In particular, if I wanted to recurse, I would need this uh, D code, the, the column code, to be itself a tensor code. And if I wanted to keep recursing, it would have to be a high dimensional tensor, okay? So that's a major problem because if I wanted to overall just keep recursing, 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 what I would have is that there would not really be a code D. What I would have would just be a high dimensional tensor of a multiplication code, E. And that's a problem because if we are, you know, we, we saw before that if our code E has distance delta, we saw that the behavior of distance and rate is that it sort of uh, erases it to the power of whatever number of times you tensor it, right? We saw that if you do it uh, once, it, it squares and so on. So the, the main thing is if we want our code E to have constant distance because we're aiming for constant sums, even just the first round, 
it means that the rate of the code C becomes vanishing. And just sending it over will be too long. OK, so we cannot, we cannot do this trick. Doing this sort of, what I described here is really just doing some check, essentially, which will not work by itself, or some check for tensor codes. Is there like a different operation you could interleave it with to keep the parameters? Sort of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but so far, this doesn't work. And a different uh, operation will be code switching. So the idea, so you know, exactly, you know, we keep the entire picture that we had uh, as before. We've selected the rth column, but now I'm really, as promised, the rth column is coming from a linear time encodable code, not a code that, you know, not a tensor code that I can keep recursing on. But luckily enough, we have this mechanism of code switching, right? If we're not happy with the code, we just switch to some other code, right? So what we'll do is we'll ask for the prover to send a fresh, so the, 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 the rth column was encoded via the linear time encodable code, and I'm gonna ask the prover, hey, Mr. Prover, can you please send it to me under a fresh encoding, under a nicer code, okay? At first glance, it may seem kind of weird because, you know, these things were already encoded. I, if I encode them, you know, if I want to switch to some other code, why didn't I a priori encode them using that code? And the point is that the prover only needs to encode the rth column using this new code rather than all of the columns. And therefore, she can afford to introduce more redundancy. Right? Because we are only encoding a single column, we can use a sort of um, better encoding in terms of distance that has worse rate. Because we, we don't need to encode each and every column. So that's the key, the key idea. One thing to worry about, which may be because uh, you came to the talk on uh, Tuesday, you, you're not going to be too worried about, is that the prover could send the wrong encoding, not, like, not send the encoding of the same message under a different code. But let's ignore that for now. We'll, go, we'll get back to that later. Okay, so for the moment, whenever I, I ask the prover to send a fresh encoding of a message, let's believe that it actually does so. Good, so you know, given this idea, I think the protocol almost uh, is immediate. And here's the bird's eye view. So the point is that you know, as we uh, recurse, we're shrinking by a factor A. I'm using L to denote the depth of the recursion because I was something else before. Uh, so L is the depth of the recursion. In level um, zero, we're starting off with a message of length n. As we go along, we shrink by a factor of a. And the point is that you know, after l levels of uh, recursion, we are handling messages of size n over a to the l. And I claim that at this point, we can afford to introduce an overhead in terms of time, an additional like a to the l over 2 overhead. In a second, we'll see why, basically, because of uh, how the geometric series works. But, but you know. Let's believe me for a second that you can afford this extra overhead in time. Given this extra overhead in time, you can afford to use, to get like, uh, to use, to, to have like lower rates. And if you believe that using a code that sort of hits the singleton bound, you, you'll have like rate a to the minus L over two, and you'll get distance one minus that. Okay, so this will be uh, our distance in the code in the Lth level of the iteration. Why is this good? Now you just do some uh, you know, back of the envelope uh, calculation. If I'm summing the work that the proof is investing overall throughout all of the rounds, then you have this sort of expression, which luckily enough, because of you know, how some of a uh, geometric series works, is strictly linear. Okay, that's on, one, on, on the one side. On the other side, in terms of soundness, now instead of having, we, we, we don't have like a constant soundness error in each level of the recursion, the soundness error in each level keeps going down and down, right? It's like in every round, it's a to the minus L over two, and which we, if we choose our a to be large enough, that will be a, you know, sufficient, it will be a constant. Basically a constant determined by a. So I have this slide with the worm's eye view. I think the bird's eye view is, is better. So let me uh, skip it. Let me mention um, one important thing is that I wanted to always, oh, this should be a to the minus L over two. I wanted the distance of my code to be um, one minus a to the minus L over two. But I mean, in the beginning, I, I was talking about using sort of a, a binary error correcting code because I'm looking at Boolean circuits. I want the binary code to be compatible with that and not to have like overhead coming in from just using a larger alphabet. But binary codes can have at most uh, distance one half. And here I want sort of distances approaching one. So actually, as I proceed throughout this protocol, not only am I going to be switching codes, I'm also going to be switching fields. 
Okay, so I start off with a small field, and gradually throughout the protocol, whenever I switch a code, I also switch to a larger and larger field. I'll be working with extension fields, so it will be, it will be okay. okay. So as we, as we make progress, we're switching both codes and, and the underlying field. Just so that we have a, a, we can get the good distance from the code. So just to summarize, what does the protocol look like? Um, so we are given, we have our basic code C0, under, which is the code that I told you, right? It's a tensor of a linear time encodable code with a multiplication code. Right, so n over a times a, that's C0. The prover computes the w, that thing that we had on the uh, bottom right, as before, sends it over to the verifier. The verifier chooses a column, uh, so we call them R0. Now the prover sends a fresh encoding of the rth columns. This will be C1 and C1 prime. These are fresh encodings under sort of a new code C1, which is analogous to C0. It's again like a tensor of a linear time encodable code with a multiplication code, where the multiplication code now, we can afford for it to have worse rate and better distance. In particular, if you see, you look at the next W that is sent, because we're using a multiplication code with worse rate, it's gonna be a little bit longer. Okay, so this keeps alternating where the size of the message C, the columns, keeps shrinking, but the size of the Ws keeps increasing as we go along. So one thing I didn't tell you about is the consistency checking, although that really uh, is very tightly connected to what we saw last time with, with code switching. So, how, so the point is now, you know, in each round, the prover is sending a fresh encoding. So the verifier already has uh, an encoding of uh, CL, and the, pr the prover is sending a fresh encoding of the same message under a new code. That's called that CL plus one. And we want to check that indeed the messages encapsulated within are the same messages. So we need a way to do this. And first of all, as I said last time, using these procedures of local testing and self-correction, at the very least, we know that the what the prover sent are indeed code words. We just need to check that the messages inside are the same. So let's, let's see how to do that. So this is sort of a lemma. Let's imagine that we have sort of a general lemma. It says, if we have two tensor codes, C and D, where the message sizes are the same, k, the block length, the size of code words, can be different, so n and n prime, but both are tensor codes, then I claim that there is an efficient procedure for checking membership in this language, namely that given two code words, the message inside is exactly the same. Um, so let's actually show the, the proof of this quickly. So, right, so we are given, we as a verifier, are given Oracle access to C of M and some D of M prime. And our goal in life is to check that M is equal to M prime. So just as a mental uh, exercise, let's compare C of M versus C of M prime. Okay, what we have is an encoding under D of M prime, but let's think of C of M prime. What do we know? Well, if it happens to be that M is equal to M prime, then certainly C of M and C of M prime are equal. But if M is different from M prime, then C of M and C of M prime, not only are they not equal, they're not equal in a lot of places because they are both code words of C. So now if you imagine choosing a random coordinate I uh, of this code, then if M is equal to M prime, of course C of M and C of M prime will agree on this coordinate. Whereas if the messages are different, because the code has distance, they will disagree with high probability. Right, so the verifier will, will so this is all nice as a mental experiment, but the verifier doesn't actually have C prime of uh, C of M prime. But still, the verifier chooses I, and we have these properties. So, and, and let's uh, indeed assume that, you know, we were lucky enough, we hit one of the, don't have to be super lucky because we have distance, but that indeed we hit one of the co coordinates on which they differ. The observation, the next observation, is that if you look at C M prime in position I, because C is a linear code, this is some linear function of the message M prime. Right? We don't have direct access to this because we only have access to D of M prime. Um, so the situation that we're at is that we have Oracle access to D of M prime and we want to check some linear function of M prime. And we've seen a way to do this, right? So sort of sum check uh, is, does this. We again run into this like, annoying issue that we had last time that we have coefficients because this is a specific linear function, it's not just a sum. 
but the exact same issue that we had last time, uh, we have here in the exact same solution. So if you're careful about it, we can observe that the coefficients of this claim, if C is a tensor code, the coefficients viewed as a matrix have rank one, and then some check just works plug and play. Okay, so that's how we check consistency throughout all of this, the prover sending over these fresh encodings. Questions? Yeah. So what is the uh, tensor structure of D? Like, does D need to be a high-dimensional tensor? For... Uh, no, no. So, so D was the linear time encodable code. It can be a square tensor of your favorite linear time encodable code. I see, but I'm doing some check over it. It's enough to do a sort of, so, so, so think of like a sum check over a square thing. So you just need like a quadratic saving. Uh, quadratic saving is enough for you. Good, so we've seen the key part, which is the linear time inner product check. Using this, how do we get IOP for circuits? Basically following the same temp template that we saw last time, which is quite standard. So we have a circuit. We're trying to con construct an IOP for this circuit. Let's assume the circuit just contains uh, NAND gates. We denote the wire values by W, if you uh, here as a function. I, I, I use the K as the number of wires just because the, that was the size of messages in my code. And we have these sort of, I think of it as permutations saying for each gate, what are its left and right inputs. Same thing that we had exactly that we had last time, but the things that we need to check now are sort of this NAND check, that W in position I is equal to the NAND of W, L, I, and W, R, I. To check that, indeed, W, L, and W, R were computed correctly. Um, so this is the sort of function composition, uh, the circle there. And then the input and output is consistent. Okay? So that's exactly the same picture that we had uh, last time in terms of like how our IOP is designed. Let me sort of, but my point is sort of just showing or reminding why really the key point is an inner product check. So let's look, for example, on this test, this uh, sort of permutation test. How did it work? Well, we wanted to check that this happens uh, for all uh, indices i. What we said is you can choose a random or pseudorandom vector r. The test that it happens for every i reduces to this kind of inner product. And now you, uh, you rearrange or relabel, re and both sides that you have are basically an inner product. So you just run our uh, fast linear time inner product check, and you can do this. And the same thing you can do for the NAND test, uh, even more direct. Good. So what do we have so far? We basically proved the first theorem that I showed you, that for every Boolean circuit, we have an argument system with constant prover overhead, for Boolean circuits with constant prover overhead and con constant soundness error. That was the, the, the first result. Um, maybe before moving to the second result, just a quick digest, which also relates to one of your questions from last time. So in all of the previous works that were using code switching, there was sort of, sort of one sharp code switch. Right? We encoded under a fast code. We pretended that we had encoded under some different code, and the end we switched. Here we're doing sort of a much more gradual process. We're alternating. We're doing this very gentle, gradual code switching in, every, uh, in each and every step um, and gaining, gaining from that. Just as a reminder, when we didn't have this uh, inner product check, what did we use last time for those um, inner products? So, so we, we did, we just didn't give, give them a name. What we could say is, you know, you take, uh, you multiply, if you use a multiplication code, you can just multiply two code words. The result, and now, like, the inner, the inner product will now just be a sum of the product code word. Right? Um, so just, it just didn't have a name. But, but it was there. OK. Um, so let's talk about how do we get 2 to the minus lambda soundness error. I, we are going to pay for that. Um, the payment will be poly log lambda overhead for the prover, which is very modest, right? Just to remind ourselves, again, lambda is what, 128? We're not saying multiply by 128. We're saying multiply by log of that. But it, it is a very uh, mild overhead. OK, so we want to get uh, IOPs. The first task is, you know, th that I'll show you is how do we, how do we get a linear time inner product check with 2 to the minus lambda soundness error, where I allow myself this polylog lambda overhead. OK, so same thing that we did before with constant prover overhead and constant soundness. Now I want to achieve with 2 to the minus lambda error and uh, polylog lambda overhead. OK, and it will turn out to be 
pretty easy. I'll show it to you on the whiteboard. All right, so now our goal is again to solve the same like inner product, uh, design a code that supports inner product check where we're aiming for very good soundness error, but we're willing to tolerate this polylog lambda overhead. So here's the idea. Um, the code will be, yet again, a tensor code. And it will again be uh, a tensor where this kind of skewed picture, um, actually this, let's show here, so here's the message and here's the entire code word. The, 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 the tensor is skewed, the number of columns is lambda, the security parameter, and number of rows is n over lambda. Okay. For my row code, I'm going to use a read Solomon code with, say, rate uh, one half or, or one third or something like that. So this is like, overall, this is maybe like a O of lambda. Okay. For my column code, I'm going to use the code that I, we just used, um, or sorry, that we just constructed. Okay, so it's some code that supports linear time um, inner product checks with constant soundness error. That itself came from a tensor, but I want to forget about that. So it's some code that supports uh, efficient inner product checks, okay? So this is, uh, this is the, the code that I'm using to get this new result. I want to show an inner product check, so I actually have two code words. All right, so this is code word C. Uh, sorry, co code word C and code word C prime. And my goal is to compute the inner product between, uh, I think it was blue before. Let's try to be consistent. All right, I want to compute the inner product between these two things. I'm going to follow the sort of same moral strategy as before. Think of taking these, each row here of both of these is a multiplication code. I'm going to do the pointwise multiplication. This is just in the prover's head. I uh, just need to do it up to here. So these are obtained by just multiplying, viewing each one of these as a polynomial, multiplying the two, I get this. And I add all the stuff up and I get the same W that I had before, right? And it's exactly as before, there's W that is computed correctly, and if the prover wants to cheat, it has to send some W tilde, which is, di is different. What we did before is to choose a random coordinate and check it. What I'm going to do now is different. I'm going to ch check each and every one of the coordinates of W. How, so like coordinate number one, how do I check it? Well, how is it computed? It was computed as the sum of these guys, and these guys were each computed as the, sum, as the product of these two columns, so really the first coordinate here is just itself an inner product between these two columns. Right, so I'm going to run the protocol that I had before, which sounds weird because it only has constant soundness error, and I'm shooting for two to the minus lambda soundness error. The point though is that when the prover sends cheats and sends W tilde, it's going to send a false claim on a constant fraction of these coordinates. So when I, it, it may very, very well be the case that the value here is different, and I only have constant soundness error, so I won't catch it. But it's also going to be different in a bunch of other coordinates, and in each one of them, so in like O of lambda coordinates. And in each one of them, I have a constant probability of catching the prover. So overall, I get my two to the minus lambda, two to the minus omega lambda probability of catching. Okay, questions? Yeah. So for the column code, you still do need this uh, code to support in a product sum check, and also it has this systematic property that encodes the message, uh, like it keeps the message intact at the first. Yeah, I mean, um, so for me it's very convenient when in dealing generally with tensors to think of systematic codes. So I usually just, and, and it's often usually for free, so I usually just don't, don't worry about thinking of, of non-systematic code. If you're asking whether it generalizes to non-systematic codes, um, possibly, I haven't thought about that. But here you're using this very special uh, code that uh, uh, allows you, uh, it itself is a tensor code, right? Right, so I, I kind of forgot about it. What I cared about is for it being able to compute the uh, inner product. Um, you're right that we constructed that itself from a tensor code. And I, I think at some point I thought it out, we're doing a lot of tensoring, some of it is unnecessary. Um, it's just as, as useful abstractions because I don't want to worry about 
Um, you know, we just want to think, oh, this supports inner product checks. I'm not trying to save on the amount of tensoring. Definitely, if you were to thinking of making this practical, that's something you would want to do. Uh, but here, I'm, I'm just looking for the asymptotic statement and the cleanest way of stating it. Thank you for the question. OK. Um, good, so we pretty easily got this 2 to the minus lambda soundness error. Let me show you another uh, sort of uh, issue that, that comes up usually when designing uh, IOPs. Often we need to check, uh, so something that comes up a lot and we'll have a sort of related solution is that we are given access to a code word and we want to check, uh, I'll say in uh, double quotes, that it vanishes or essentially is zero on some like nice structured uh, part of the domain, let's say over here. Okay, uh, people use vanishes because people usually think about polynomials and polynomials are zero, means that they vanish. Um, so, so, right, so I want a protocol where I have Oracle access to this uh, code word C, and I want to check that it's sort of identically zero over here. So the traditional method of doing this is saying, hey, you know, if this code word is supposed to vanish here, let's, you know, choose a random uh, linear combination and look at the inner product of this code word with a random vector. Right, that's sort of the, the usual way what we, we saw a bunch of times, both last time and this time. And the problem that I have here is that th this usually works. It, it usually works really well. It has like one over a uh, field size soundness error, which is usually just perfect. But we are looking at very small fields, right? We're looking, say, at, at GF2. So this would only have one half soundness error, which I cannot afford, right? One thing I could do is repeat this, but then I wouldn't, I would, you know, I need, would need to repeat lambda times, I get n times lambda instead of n times polylog lambda. So I cannot do the standard trick. So, so let's see how we do this. Um, again, very, very simple. So let's look for a second on this, um, using all the colors. Let's look at this part over here. So we, want, we want to check that the red part vanishes. What I'm going to do is think of encoding this guy um, with, so encoding each row using an additional error correcting code. Okay, a linear error correcting code. So I just, I took these guys, each row here, and encoded it over here. So I have this kind of picture. What do I know? Suppose that this guy was not identically zero there was some like annoying uh, seven hiding here. Everywhere else was zero. So it's hard to catch because it's just like one place. So the, uh, the observation is that if, if I have this annoying seven here, seven is just an example, okay? Um, then the entire row here will have a lot of, of, of sevens or like other numbers, not zeros, right? This, a lot of the entries here will be corrupt. So now what I'm going to do is run like, um, this sort of vanishing test on each and every one of the columns, each one with a constant soundness error. So for that, I can again, for each one of those, I can use the random linear combination and I can use the code from before because I'm only, aim I'm only shooting for constant soundness error. But I do this for each and every one of the coordinates. So as before, because a constant fraction of them, so O of lambda, are corrupt with two to the minus omega lambda, I'm gonna catch it. And sort of in terms of like the, this machinery so far, would be uh, good enough to get you the NAND test that we need when you're constructing IOPs for circuits. So let's talk for a second about the permutation check. Okay, when we want to check the things are permutation of one another. Um, so we want to check something of this, of, of the form that we have here, sorry. That's C of pi i is equal to C prime of i for every index i. And the way we solved it, you know, earlier today and, and last time was using this idea of random linear combinations, relabel, um, and that's that. But now we are running again to the issue that our field is small. We cannot afford a one over f uh, error. So we cannot do the, use this trick. So we need a solution and I don't have one, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, if you have one, I'd be more than, uh, I would be ex extremely excited to see it. Um, what I do have is a solution that works if the permutation is nice enough. Okay, so before we had a solution that worked for every permutation. Here it will only work for permutations that are nice. And that is the reason why we can only handle these circuits with like regular substructure. I'll give just like a, a, an idea, flavor of why for structured permutations, 
uh, things are easier. I'll leave some room in between. Right, so the, the situation that we care about is that we have C and C prime, and the contents of the message there are supposed to be a permutation, a specific permutation of the contents of the message here. But in reality, we know that in our IOP, the message here is going to sort of be like the values of the wires of the circuit, and here it's going to be sort of the left or right wires or something like that. So think of it as, you know, if I just, if I do something like take some small function and repeat it a lot of times, what I will see here will be sort of the value of the, the input, and then the value after the first step, value after second step, and so on, all the steps of the function. And then if I look at the sort of left wires and right wires, morally what you're supposed to see is the same picture, but shifted up or shifted down in one dire in a, in a direction, right? So um, this will maybe go here. Everyone will be shifted up. So that, that's the kind of permutation that we, that we uh, will be restricted to. But why is it easier to handle such permutations? Well, you can think of an intermediate code word in which you sort of separate, there were sort of two th things going on, um, or actually the way I described it, yeah, the, no, the, the way I described it, there's not much going on. Like, all, all you have is a, the, the permutation is basically just like move one up kind of flavor. In reality, there's going to be like uh, stuff going on uh, locally between the layers, but let's sort of, let, let's ignore that for a second or f uh, forever. Um, so we're just thinking of doing something like a, a very, very, very specific permutation moving the rows up by one, and that is simple enough that we can handle directly without using the random linear combinations. So morally speaking, without getting into all the details. Let me just cover like one more annoyance, mainly because it like really annoyed us, but uh, there's a happy ending to this story. Um, so this is an, an issue that we call projectability. So suppose, you know, we've worked hard, we've designed this li like an amazing linear uh, size IOP, so IOP that can be computed by a linear size prover, and we have our linear size vector commitment, what do we do now? Well, you know, instead of sending the IOP messages, we commit, we decommit, everyone is happy, and we're done. But here's like a super annoying issue. So suppose that you, you know, you've done, you've, you've run the IOP and you've committed to all the messages. Now the verifier says, hey, come on, I want to open up these coordinates. Now you're sort of, what you need to do is take all your IOP messages and project them to these coordinates, or select these coordinates, right? So it's like really, uh, sounds like really uh, trivial, but we're in a circuit model in which it becomes really annoying. So what you're trying to design is a circuit that gets as input a long string and a bunch of uh, indices into the string, like so a string of length n, k indices into the string, and it outputs the projection of the string to these indices or, sele or selection. So really like a multiplexer, but for a bunch of indices, not just one. And the naive, if you try for uh, 10 seconds, you'll get a construction of size n times k, so doing something separate for each index. But the number, k is going to be the number of queries in our IOP, which is lambda, at least, and uh, the IOP string is the circuit size. So if you did the naive thing, you would, just this stupidity would give you to circuit size times security parameter, which we want to avoid. So the question is, can you do better? And in principle, there's no reason why not. I mean, the input to your circuit is just of length sort of n plus k. And you know, maybe you can do a better circuit. So for uh, the first two papers, we had really annoying ad hoc solutions, which were sort of saying, we're going to design our IOP with a very particular query set. So like indices that we select, are going to have a very specific structure, which was hard to maintain um, and hard to have. And for those kind of uh, uh, indices, we had a good circuit. Uh, the happy ending is uh, we have an upcoming work in which we showed you can do this in general. So uh, there is a circuit that gets input a string and in indices, and in size n plus k outputs their projection. OK, so uh, that's that. Um, let me sort of conclude with some open problems, um, something that I'm you know, very interested in and uh, um, would love to see is do these ideas which are, you know, you've seen, I'm taking a very uh, asymptotic point of view, can they have practical relevance? Can we use them potentially to get better sounds for some check that was some, somehow the limiting factor? I think we can get better sounds, sounds but the question is, can this be, uh, you know, practically relevant? 
In terms of more uh, theory questions, this polylog lambda overhead, I think, would be an amazing result to get rid of. So we're getting like strictly linear size circuits with a small subconstant soundness error, ideally exponentially small. Um, I should mention that this question is a major question also in sort of kind of more traditional zero knowledge proofs, which are not required to be succinct. So if you insist on zero knowledge, um, but don't require the communication to be succinct. If you want strictly linear size provers and negligible soundness, this has been you know, explicitly open for 15 years and of major interest. So that, that's super interesting. One way to get to do it would be via linear time encodable multiplication codes, which we don't have. Um, another thing is sort of, sort of getting constant round um, or, or getting even a non-interactive solution. Um, Another thing I'm very interested in, so there have been like really uh, beautiful works, sort of uh, starting with, with work of uh, Justin's on getting, improving the, the prover efficiency of GKR. It's, um, uh, I would say, an important protocol in the literature. Let me not uh, go into the not super important. But uh, the state of the art is that this protocol can be done for arithmetic circuits with a linear size or, or time prover. For a Boolean circuit, which is sort of the default notion, I think, in, from a complexity point of view, um, we don't know how to do this. And that, that's uh, skip number five, maybe. OK, so I'll end here. So I wanted to ask you about number five. OK, so, so, so let, me, let me explain number yeah. five then. <laughs> right, so I was kind of like throughout this talk, I was kind of shoving zero knowledge aside. Basically said, you know, we can tack on zero knowledge for free. The reason that this works is sort of once you have a succinct argument, morally you can just add zero knowledge for free on top of that. But it is uh, not so friendly. In particular, it means that you're using, uh, you're going to be making sort of something that we, we call uh, non-black box use of cryptography, and not something that's going to be very friendly in practice. Um, a better way of doing this would have to be to have our IOP itself be zero knowledge. And then when you just compile it in the traditional sense of Merkle trees, things would, would work out. So the, the question here is trying to, you know, at the level of the IOP, make it zero knowledge. So, sorry, go ahead. No, that was, uh, that's what I wanted to know, but I, I think, ah. yeah. So, so uh, did you think about this for your protocol? Um, not, not, not so much. I think, uh, so, uh, I think you're not on that, right? Uh, I think Ale has a version of the, w with the code switching and for like arithmetic circuits yeah. that gets uh, zero knowledge. I suspect that similar uh, techniques could work here, but I haven't thought about it too much. Yeah. Do you have a sense of um, what kind of algorithms like can be executed in a Boolean circuit without overhead? Um, SHA. <laughs> so, or a um, lot of this, SHAs. This multiplexer thing apparently can, but it's a, it's a whole paper. Um, but, 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 uh, but the multiplexer is, I think, is a bad example because this is something that is really a triviality on for an algorithm. Right. Right. So something that's really trivial in an algorithm, just like output, you know. Well, I, well, that's so I'm, uh, I'm actually thinking of like Pippinger's algorithm, mm -hmm. um, which sort of has to put things in the buckets, mm -hmm. um, and I guess we don't know that you could do something like that in a circuit without right. overhead, but I'm wondering if there's some kind of um, intuition or rule of thumb for like where the line is. Like, uh, um, so not surprisingly, random access is a problem. Yeah. Um, is that like a rule of thumb? I think uh, maybe, yeah, not, uh, I think it's a great question. I don't have a great answer, unfortunately. Okay. Um, so random, it's worth random thinking access about. is definitely a problem. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's the primary problem. Right. I'm trying to think if uh, things like, uh, I mean, random access is a problem, but we are, in some sense, this multiplexer thing is addressing this. So we have, we, we can do something. Um, it is still, obviously, I mean, in a RAM, you just need like uh, K ra trivial RAM operations to retrieve K indices. You were saying you need O of N, which is, Took us a lot of work and, and sweat and so on, um, so I'm not sure if it would be like plug and play in, in, into some other RAM algorithm. Um, yeah, very interesting. Does this projection thing have other applications in like circuit simulation of RAM algorithm things like that? Um, hmm. 
It seems like a pretty fundamental question. I, I agree. Uh, the reviewers did not. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I don't know if something explicit. It feels to me very fundamental and basic and something that should have been uh, you know, pointed out in the 70s, but we didn't, uh, apparently it was not. Um, in terms of applications, like in general to doing uh, RAMs, um, I don't know. We do have an, an application of this for doing batch peer, which is like some other crypto thing, but uh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs>